hello. Anybody there? Good morning. Hey, good morning, Mary. Hey, Jamie. How are you? I'm good. Happy Sunday. Yes, yes. Thank you so much, uh, Mary, for taking the time to do this. And I'm really excited to get to talk about so much of your work, and especially now that you're working to, uh, to help people bring their stories to life. But if we could start at the beginning in terms of your own personal experience and, and how you come to writing, how you come to storytelling overall, uh, if you'd be uh, willing to share a couple of things about what was growing up in the South like and, uh, and when did you discover writing? Yeah, I'd love to. So I, I think I had like maybe many people who become creatives. I think I always felt like a fish out of water as a child. <laughs> I don't know how much of that had to do with being in the South, except that I do think, you know, being in the South, there is a sort of like, which I think is pretty well known, a kind of persona that is expected of you when you're out in public, <laughs> <laughs> which I, I think I picked up on quite early. It was like, always be polite, you know, never show what you're really feeling if it's negative. You know, we always had bows in our hairs as little girls. And um, so like we never had a run in our stockings. We like actually wore stockings and called them stockings <laughs> to church. And so I, I'm sure that probably contributed to it. But I always kind of felt like, huh, I don't like I I find my secret imaginary world like a lot more interesting than the world I actually live in. <laughs> so I loved reading, escaping into books like Madeline Lingle's books and like A Wrinkle in Time was my favorite. And um, because I had a very religious family and was always at mm. church, we did a lot of like Christian bookstore visits, or, like some Christian novels, that, children's novels I got really into. And then, but I, I don't know, the, the moment I remember actually thinking, oh, maybe I could write these wasn't until seventh grade. I was 12. And I, I had never had by that point been particularly like identified as a good writer or like a, even a very gifted child academically. Like mm. I was, I remember like, I mean, I wasn't in, you know, they had classes that were like the, the gifted class. I was not in that class. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, just sort of like kind of going by doing my thing. And then I was in this seventh grade English and literature class and I loved it so much. And one day my teacher, Miss Chansey, was like giving a speech to everyone in the room. And she said, um, anyone can learn to write. Writing is a skill. Anyone can learn to write. Some people are natural writers and it just comes naturally to them though. And they're lucky. Mary Atkins is a natural writer. Mm. And I just, I like, that is, it's such a vivid memory because it was my first moment of being like, what? Mm. Like, did someone just single me out as good at something? <laughs> <laughs> like, I don't, that hadn't really happened. Like it, and it had never occurred to me that I was good at writing. Like I knew I liked doing it, but it just, I had never been affirmed for that. So I just remember like it was truly a life-changing moment because I thought, because I loved doing it too. It was like, wait, I'm good at the thing mm. that I like to do. <laughs> this is it. I'm going to be a writer. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to write books. And like from then on, I was just so excited about it. And it's what I, I mean, it's what excited me most. I went to a creative writing. I asked my parents if I like, I wanted to do it as much as possible. So like in high school, they sent me to the summer creative writing mm. camp for a few weeks. And it was like the best thing I had ever done. And um, so it was, it was really then. And just to sort of cap off the end of that story, I, then I got to college and I took my, my first semester. I'm like, I'm taking a creative writing class, like for my elective, that's what I'm going to do. And it was the opposite experience. It was super deflating. And I got a B minus on my first story and I didn't understand why. And it was like, just the whole vibe in the classroom was really um, kind of competitive and like a little bit judgmental of each other. And I, like, I didn't feel smart enough. And so that was very disillusioning and basically sent me on another path, which was law. <laughs> <laughs> for the next several years i mean maybe seven years and then i finally i came back around to, to my creative 
my creative spirit did not die. And so it just like kept nagging at me. And so I did eventually come back around to it. But it was it was interesting. It's interesting to me looking back that two very different classroom experiences had such a profound effect. Like the first one was opened up the whole world of creativity and the second one shut it down for years. Absolutely. It just goes to show the importance of a safe space and and the kind of thing that you're working on now that uh, I've heard quite a few times over the uh, First Draft Club, which is the podcast that you have for your incubator program. And uh, I I really love this uh, service that you're providing because it allows for people to kind of get their bearings, especially when they feel like they've been out in the world that doesn't really support what they try to do. Or, or believe in what they have to say. And I, I think that, um, especially in the little snippets of advice that you're giving out, I found that super uh, impressive. And, and uh, the one that stuck out for me, though, was the, uh, the getting an MFA one, which <laughs> made me feel like this is such a pivotal point in somebody's career when they're trying to get a sense of what they're going to do. And it almost feels like, like we're stifling people into, into this very regimented thing. Could you elaborate a little bit on your thoughts on getting an MFA and, and, you know, pursuing that, uh, on an academic track. Yeah. I, um, I've talked, as you mentioned, I've talked quite a bit about this, like on, I, yeah, I have a podcast episode about it and I did a YouTube video about it. And then I talked to the writers I work with about it some, because I'm, I didn't, I don't, I do not have an MFA and I did apply for an MFA a few times. Um, couple times did not get in a couple times did get in but never ended up going and which I you know whatever I just sort of thought of that as like part of my journey to to writing novels um but then I started to work with writers and I would find that a number of them would be like they would like come out of MFA programs like like wounded warriors <laughs> like they would be like dragging limbs and be like yeah. I, need, I don't know what to do like how do I start writing again and so it, I just got curious like what is happening to these people like why that like this is supposed to be something that really launches a creative writing career and doesn't rather than it's supposed to launch a creative career not like destroy a writer before they even have a career mm. you know and it seemed to very often be the latter. And so when I started asking more questions, it it seemed like, oh, okay, well, there, there are a few things that are often going on in master's programs that could be contributing to this. Like one is that people go, often go in thinking they're going to write a book or like write a novel or write a memoir. And then, and actually a, a, a master's um and creative writing professor is the one who told me this. He said, the reason that doesn't happen is because we don't want to read people's full books. So we teach them (laughs) because we are also (laughs) overworked and not making enough money. So we teach them how to write short pieces because that's what we're willing to read for our workload because we're also trying to write. So it's like, oh, okay. So a lot of times the curriculum that you're going through is not designed to help you write a novel because the professors who are teaching are willing to read shorter pieces. So like you end up learning how to write maybe short stories or essays. Um, but that's, that's what you're writing for your grades. That's what you're learning how to write. And then you leave again, this is what I was told with like these shorter pieces, but like if you don't know how to write a long form there, as one person told me, she's like, I left and I actually had a great experience learning how to write short things, but I had no idea how to write a long form narrative, Mm -hmm. which is what I had always wanted to do. And I also didn't know how to get it published because that wasn't part of the program because it's not, you know, it's not a master's in like how to get a book published. It's a master's in creative writing. So, so it's really that's one piece. And then another piece was that, which I heard from people over and over again, was that the the drive is really pushing people to write literary fiction, but, but really that's such a small genre of fiction, yeah. you know, like when it comes to reading, it's like, that's just the tiny, like the tiniest one. <laughs> like the, the genres are so popular and they're so fun and they're not inferior. Like, I, I mean, they sort of in certain circles have this reputation of being like maybe easier to write or something but i don't think that's true (laughs) like for anyone who actually writes them if you asked it'd be like no they're pretty hard like it's pretty hard to learn how to write a really good thriller 
Um, so for writers who want to write what they like to read, which might be a genre, like a thriller or romance, then sometimes masters can kind of divert them in the wrong direction because they, they don't, you know, they go in thinking, oh, I'm going to write, I'm going to write fantasy. And then there's not really support for that in the program. Mm -hmm. So these are just factors that I now like to share with people who are considering master's programs. Cause I think it, I would have wanted, to, I, I didn't end up going mainly because of money, but I think if I had known those factors, it also would have helped me make like a more empowered decision. Mm -hmm. That that wasn't the right path for me because what I wanted was to write like mainstream fiction. Um, I wanted to write the best book I could, but I wanted it to be like a book a lot of people would want to read and a novel, you know, like that was my goal. So I, I didn't, I don't know that like spending a few years and, and, you know, tens of thousands of dollars learning to write, for example, short fiction, that that was not what I was looking for. That would have been sort of an overlapping, but tangential, I think, direction. Yeah, that's amazing. And it reminds me of a couple of things that I'm going to ask you in just a moment, but to elaborate a little bit on making your way back into the publishing industry and finding those inroads. Um, I'd like to know what was the turning point that led you out of law school or, or out of that career path into, into this more true to you approach and, and drive to get your work out there to get it published and, and serve others in this way that you are. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for asking that. Cause I love telling this story. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I actually really enjoyed law school. I thought it was really fun and interesting. I liked reading cases. I like, you know, ca cases are all stories of people. So it was like fun to read it and they all have conflict. So like, that was really fun for me. And then I graduated from law school and I still had this, this nag to write. So I thought this was like the cute part. I thought, well, I'll just be a lawyer during the day and then I'll write at night. <laughs> <laughs> and I got into my law job and it was not only clear that I wasn't going to have time to do that because it was a very um, labor intensive and like time intensive job. But it also, I mean, on my second day of my job, it was, I had the strangest sensation and I know you're a playwright, so maybe you'll appreciate this. Like, I, I felt like I was in a play, mm. and it was not my life. I was like, "What? Who? What is this life I have found myself in? Because it is not mine." I was like an actor. Like, I remember standing in my office and being like, "What is this life I have just landed in? I am, feel like I'm on a stage. Like, this is just <laughs> not me." And it was so palpable. Like this feeling. It was just. It wasn't even, it wasn't even miserable. Like it was just so not my life. It was like, wait, what? Like I felt like I had to reconstruct the steps that had gotten me there because it was so foreign. Like I was memorizing lines. So like, and I would go into meetings in other people's offices and sit there and be like, I just massive imposter syndrome in the sense that it would be like, can everyone tell that I am not the person who's sitting here and I am just playing a role? Like, what am I doing? And so pretty immediately I started trying to get out of that job because it just felt so foreign to me. I was like, this cannot be what I do. I didn't realize being a lawyer was like this, but I can't have this feeling of being in someone else's life. And at what, what it also became clear was that, that like seventh grade girl who loved writing, she like got really loud in my head. Mm. It was like, that's because what we really are supposed to be doing is writing, Mary. <laughs> <laughs> so like, what have you been doing? Let's write. And it so I, the, the positive thing about that moment is that I did feel like I had a lot of clarity. It was like, I need to be writing and I need to have a lifestyle that allows me to do that. And so very quickly, I set out on finding a job that could support my writing. Um, and I was extremely like practical about that. It was like, okay, well, I need to have several hours a day to write. I can't be thinking about another job I care about. I don't mm. think I can be a lawyer. Like, I don't think I can be a lawyer and write. So I need to do something that's like 
I could become a barista. I could, but like I needed to make a big enough hourly wage that I would also not have to work so many hours that I didn't have time to write. You know, like it was just very practical about that stuff. Um, but like something like being a barista made sense because it was like, I need to be able to leave work at work and then go home and write. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't want to be thinking about it at home. So what I ended up finding was tutoring because it paid enough per hour that I could do it for like four or five hours a day and pay my bills. But that left a lot of hours a day I could write. Mm. So so I got, and I, I knew I couldn't to like, I didn't, wouldn't be able to find enough clients on my own at first to just be like an independent tutor. So I found a tutoring job through a company that was, became my, I, I owe this company so much. I ended up working there for 10 years, Oh wow! Um, but they were wonderful. And everyone who worked there was basically an artist but there was a painter, there was a filmmaker, like everyone was an artist and it had been founded by people who were like passionate entrepreneurs. And so one of the conversations that my new boss said to me was like, okay, how many hours of tutoring do we need to get you each week so that you can support yourself? Mm. And I don't even remember what the number, I think I told him like 25 or something. He's like, okay, we'll do it. Like he, he was so, it was just such an amazing connection to have made. And they've since closed, shuttered their door. Oh, no. But like I, yeah, it was great. And then I met a bunch of other artist friends there who became friends because we were all tutoring. And then, you know, one friend was like painting. Another <laughs> friend was right, also writing a novel. Like we, I just got to know so many artists through this tutoring company because we were all doing that too. Mm, that's incredible. I mean, uh, talk about finding a community and a bit of support. You know, there's something really inspiring and empowering about a shared cause, right? Even if you are working with other writers or creatives in various disciplines, it's like you feel that energy and it just propels you to actually do something and yeah. get something done. Right. And I imagine that coincided yeah. with becoming a parent, which is another, <laughs> another huge experience. And yeah, I got to applaud you for that because just being a mom, you mentioned in your bio, you had a newborn when you started working on your, on your first novel. Is that right? My, it was my second novel, oh. but yes, exactly. Okay. So something I learned that I didn't know before it happened to me was that in uh, kind of a, a typical traditional publishing route, after you sell your first book, you can often sell subsequent novels on proposal. So your publisher will buy it before you've even written it. So oh. that is what happened to me with my second novel. Not my first, first one I had to write. Um, but the second one sold on a proposal and it actually sold the, na- the same night that I had my son. So it was like oh, wow. all a whirlwind of 24 hours. But then I had a newborn and, and a book that I had to write because I had a book contract. So it was it was a pivotal moment because I, my first novel I had written over six years with this tutoring job that I like would work on for a few hours a day. And then it'd be like, well, I now have six hours to write. So I would just like go write in coffee shops or at bars and then stay out really late with my friends and drink. <laughs> and like, it was just, it, I had so much time to like mull and walk. And, and so this time it was like, I don't think that's going to work this time because <laughs> I don't even have time to take a shower. <laughs> so I was like, how am I, how am I going to do that with a newborn? So it was like a, it, I'm really grateful for it now because I had to come up with an actual process for writing under pressure, mm-hmm. which is what I now use because I'm still a parent and what I teach because a lot of the writers I work with also aren't like, people who have structured their entire life around being able to write like they, they, you know, I had that luxury when I was in my twenties and I was like left law and had all that clarity, like I'm going to become a tutor. And I found that dream tutoring job. Like that just, that was all very, um, alchem, alchemical. I don't know if that's a word, <laughs> but like alchemy. Yeah. But most of most writers don't have that. So like most of the writers I work now, they have jobs, they have like actual jobs, you know, that, are not just four hours a day. They have families. So basically I came up with the process that I now teach 
when I was writing that second novel with a newborn at home, mm. that was kind of like, okay, I need to actually learn how to be efficient. Like, mm. how do I, how do I get a novel out when I only have a couple of hours a day tops and I feel kind of brain dead and I just need someone to tell me what to do. <laughs> <laughs> and so this is the, the 45 minutes, five days a week that you're currently using. Uh, and I, I love yeah. that you're speaking to mom author specifically because, uh, you know, obviously, as you mentioned, this can apply to many busy people, which I do think is is tremendously important. But could you elaborate a bit of what that does to your momentum? 45 minutes, five days a week. Yeah, I think so. What kind of shocked me when I was writing that second novel with a new baby is that I so I found it overwhelming to, to write a new novel. But I also it was also pressure because. I had been tutoring, right? I had been tutoring for like, at that point, five years, I think, and writing novels, but then I wanted to have a baby. So I needed like actual health insurance that would pay for that because <laughs> the health insurance <laughs> I had at the time was not going to cover that and I couldn't afford it. So I had taken a full, my first like full-time job for the health insurance so I could have a baby actually managed to get pregnant timing worked out i'm like i now have a maternity leave this mm. is amazing but that added new pressure too because i realized like okay i don't think i can write a book and have a full-time job that i'm back at and have a baby at the same time mm. so the only thing that made sense was i have to write this book on my maternity leave so i so i gave myself that so i had 12 weeks i took the first four weeks off I mean, <laughs> gave myself at least that good grief. And then I'm like, I got eight weeks. I got to write. Th I got to knock out this draft. Oh, my eight goodness. Weeks. So that I was like, I don't know if this can happen. Like, I mean, I'll just do my best, but we'll see. And what I discovered and it did it actually did happen. And it happened by basically writing 45 minutes a day, five days a week. And I it was really cool because what I discovered is that like, oh, people have this big idea of how long it takes to, to write a draft of a book. Like I, a lot of us do. I did. It's like, Oh, this is going to take me hours a day for years because the first one, it had taken that because it, that's what I had given myself and that's what it took. But it turns out when I just didn't have a very big container for writing the book, it happened anyway. Mm. So like, it was a really interesting. And I since learned that the name of this is Parkinson's law. Have you ever heard that term? No, actually. So it's the idea that certain tasks will just expand to fill up however much time you give them. Sort mm. of like packing for a trip. Like if you if you t decide like if you start packing and you're giving yourself 7 hours, you'll take 7 hours to pack. But if you only give yourself 30 minutes, you'll pack in 30 minutes, <laughs> you know. <laughs> it's like that. So it turns out like writing a book is the same way. I mean, to an extent, right? Like no one should probably try to draft a book in three days. Like that would not be a very healthy <laughs> approach to it. But within reason, like eight weeks turned out to be a totally reasonable container for me to write a first draft of a book in for about 45 minutes to an hour every day of like active writing time. Mm. And it wasn't a bad draft. Like it needed some, of course it needed revision, like, but all first drafts do. Even if I had taken four times as much time, it would have needed revision. So it was just a really cool discovery. And it, it's mm -hmm. what I really like to share with people now, because I find that a lot of times people who have a book in them will say that like, well, I just haven't started it. Like I've been thinking about this for years, but I haven't started it. Cause like, I just don't think I have time. And that's because they think they have to like take a leave from work or something mm -hmm. to do it. When really it's like, you can actually do this thing in almost like a workout schedule. Like mm -hmm. it's just kind of like adding some, it's adding a priority to your life. Like it's not nothing, um, but it doesn't have to be an overhaul. And I love that because it, it gets us out of our head and not to belabor this anymore, but I'm just curious if you could put me in the moment when you finish that manuscript or in the days when, when you sort of had that, that runner's high of, of completing something, because it, I feel like it's probably akin to working out and feeling that relief of prepping for a marathon. And then you get the marathon done, right? Yes, it was. I was so proud. It was like, did I just do that? Mm -hmm. Like, whoa, like that was crazy. It didn't feel 
it felt like I had tricked myself into doing something too, because I was also, by the way, I found it really overwhelming to write it. And so I couldn't type it. So I had to write by hand Mm. and even writing by hand, I would sometimes find it too daunting. So I would trick my brain into writing the book by starting to journal. Like it was just a journal entry. And then my journaling would drift into like brainstorming about my book. And then it would drift into writing a scene for my book. And I basically did that (laughs) every day. I wrote the whole book by tricking my brain into thinking it was just journaling. And so then that was also part of it too. It was like, did I just write a whole draft by tricking my brain (laughs) into (laughs) thinking I was just journaling? Yeah. But it's like I actually had because when I transcribed, all of those scenes I had sort of segued into from journaling, they added up to a draft of a book. And I, it was kind of, you know, it was like, I don't know how good this is. I don't know if this is cohesive, but it's something, something to send in. Um, and it turned out to, you know, again, like it needed work for sure. Mm-hmm. But my editor, I, I remember saying to my editor, like, I don't know if this is a book. <laughs> <laughs> and she goes, this is a book. I was like, it is a book. Right. I did write right. a book. Okay. <laughs> like, oh my goodness. I mean, kind of silly that we had to like, that I just needed to hear someone else call it that, but it was very affirming to hear her actually call it that. That's, that's very true. It's, it's like we are waiting for the moment of validation after so much effort poured into it. But the, you strike me as, as a disciple of Julia Cameron, right? Uh, you're, you're very Absolutely. much. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Uh, it, it seems to be like the simplest thing, but we can't get ourselves to remember. We we have to trick ourselves into knowing that we're writers again or, or creatives. I, I don't know. It doesn't make any sense, but yet it does in a very weird, intuitive way. Yeah, it's so weird. I we have been moving this summer. And so I haven't done anything creative in like two and a half months because it was packed packing up and then unpacking and then, you know, Mm -hmm. getting an electrician out here, you know, all those things. And so in the last week, I've been really fighting this sense of like, I don't think I can write anymore. I don't think I even know how I don't. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was really interesting because this morning I just kind of sat down and made myself just sort of write down a few ideas I had been having. And it was this kind of like, Hey, <laughs> there I you are. Have ideas. <laughs> like I was so shocked by it. And it's funny that we could still surprise ourselves. Like, hey, look at that. That was an idea I just had. And I don't think it's bad, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so typically when you have delivered the book and you're doing that kind of work, you're not constantly working or writing the next thing, right? I mean, there's time for pause for you, especially now with parenthood. Yeah, I l- I really enjoy the long pauses um, because yeah, I just then I get excited to write again, and you know, and it kind of makes me dive into it enthusiastically. I mean, the the downside is I do think that sort of if if the pause is long enough, the imposter syndrome does really start to sneak mm. in, sort of being like you know, almost like I don't think I still know how to. I don't know. Just like you, you, it's it's been so long since you rode a bike. You might be like, can I still ride one? I don't know. Yeah. We'll see. You know, it's kind of like that. Um, but I do take long pauses. And so do you feel that some of the, I don't want to call them extracurricular because they're very much into the writing because you, you also teach storytelling. You're doing the book incubator. Um, how does that serve you and, and fuel you into writing again since you wear many hats? Yeah, I always it's so much fun for me to teach because I'll unpack things that I've never really put conscious thought to and then it helps me as a writer too so for example um someone had asked a while back about like what are some different kind of arcs that a character could have and I had never really consciously thought through that but I thought that would be a really fun to figure out (laughs) and b could be very helpful to people including me so I I analyzed all these stories I liked and and plotted all of these different character arcs onto a graph, (laughs) Mm -hmm. just like different colors. Like a character could be like really stubborn and then have a wake up call or a character could never change or a character could believe one thing and then doubt themselves and come back to believing it. And, you know, just sort of charting out some different, not, not an exhaustive list, but just like a bunch of different possible character arcs. 
and it was so much fun. And by the end, I had this colorful chart that, you know, it's kind of on one hand, a little silly because it's like, the, of course, creativity is not like a, um, you know, like a, gra- a bar graph or in this case, a line graph. That's the word I was looking for. But also super fun because it was like, now I have this visual representation of just some different kinds of character arcs that could exist. And then they're helpful for me too, because then when I'm doing my next story, I'm like, hmm, let me go back and think about that. Mm. And like, which one of these journeys my character might be on. Um, and I, I am always careful to say, I try to be really careful to say like, I'm not giving people a formula and being like, this is the way you should do it because I know I I never want like that kind of thing to become something that stifles someone else's creativity. Mm -hmm. Like try to just always say, as soon as the tool that I'm giving you feels like a burden and not an assist, just let it go. (laughs) Like, please don't use it because I don't want, that's not helpful at that point. Right. Right. Like not every story is going to, there will be, amazing stories that don't have any of those like character arcs that I put on a put on one graph <laughs> but those are just kind of like to get people's minds oh rolling. yeah so if we could if we could dig a little bit deeper into this this program that you're uh, that you're offering now tell me a little bit more about the book incubator and the 12 month sort of sort of system that you've created because it seems like there is a, there's a tremendous amount of flexibility for all kinds yeah. of writers, for people of all walks of life, if you could share a few thoughts on on how that works. Yeah, I okay. I wanted so it's twelve months. It's called the Book Incubator. It's for novelists, and I wanted it to be both super comprehensive, like it covers everything that you would need. Because when I was writing my first novel, I felt like I was hobbling it all together. I was like taking a class in character development, taking a class in um sentence writing (laughs) um taking a class in how to get published like it was like I was just trying to hobble together my my life so I wanted it to be comprehensive and include all of that stuff so the the, like there's not you don't need anything else like come here and we're going to do all of that but I also wanted it to be really customized because of people's lifestyles, you know, people coming in and being like, listen, I don't even think I have time to write a book. I certainly don't think I have time to like write a book and redo college. Like Mm -hmm. I don't, I can't go to a million classes. I can't um, do that and to have time to write a book. And then other people who come in, they're like, I want community. I want to meet people and have writing classes and get to know each other. And so, and then also I wanted it to be for people who are coming in with a draft that they've maybe already written 17 times, like that's fine. Or people who come in and they barely even have an idea yet and haven't Mm. written a creative board since elementary school. So like, so it's super customized, basically. Um, We have writing classes that I lead. We have revising classes that Ruthie Thorpe, who is a novelist that I love and that I work with, um, she teaches the revising classes. But also there are all of these like, one-on-one opportunities to get help. So editors give people critiques on their work. Um, People can meet for a one-on-one meeting on how to develop their plot. They can meet for a one-on-one meeting on how to get a literary agent. They can uh, meet with a one-on-one meeting with their editor to talk about how their writing needs to improve. So it's sort of like they kind of come in and plug in and then it's like a candy store just kind of like take what you need when you need it and Mm. like ignore the rest because overwhelm overwhelm is the opposite of what we want like we don't Mm -hmm. i don't want people to come in and feel they don't need to do everything they shouldn't try to do everything they just like need to do what they need to do to take the next step for them whatever that is Mm -hmm. and uh i'm sure that idea um sorry i didn't mean to cut you off there but i'm sure that there's some uh, success stories or breakthroughs that were made uh, in terms of, of some of your students or folks who participated in this. Could you share a couple of examples of things that you were able to problem solve in, in uh, I guess, if we could get more specific without being specific <laughs> uh, about individuals, if that's OK? Yeah. So um, one example is um, Gail. 
Gail is totally happy with me sharing her story. She's really open about it. So she joined the program when she already had a draft of her romance novel, but she just needed to, she didn't know what to do to revise. So she started with our revising curriculum, revised that novel, and then actually had an idea <laughs> for a thriller novel that she was super excited to write. So she she wanted she set that first romance novel aside because she wanted to do a little bit more revision on it before she tried to find a literary agent. And she wrote this thriller novel using my, um, I teach a method called the four notebooks method, which is mm -hmm. like writing your book across four notebooks. She wrote that novel in eight weeks. She then transcribed it and then did a revision. So now she had two novels. This is sort of, this is someone who did a lot. Like she's a very hard worker in the program, but she had two novels, a romance novel and a thriller novel. She started querying both of them. So sending them out to literary agents. Her thriller novel um, got an agent. She signed with an agent on her last day in the program. <laughs> so oh, wow. one year since she started the program, but a novel she had only written a few months before as, <laughs> you know, in eight weeks. And then it sold to a publisher a few months later. So like she, and it's coming out in December of this year. Mm. So she, she has just like a very cool story that her timeline is just sort of a dream timeline. Like I, I try to warn people that's not typical in terms of timeline. Most people query agents for months. Um, and that's just sort of how it goes. Agents get a lot. If, if people want to go a, a certain route with a big publisher, they need to get a literary agent typically, and that takes a while. It takes everybody time. Um, Gail, Gail did it really fast, <laughs> <laughs> but that's that was a cool, very cool success story. And the thing that I love most about that story that is kind of typical is that she was able to kind of overcome her demons and uh, her internal demons enough to write that thriller mm -hmm. in eight weeks. And she had improved so much as a writer that it was like a strong draft that she wrote. I mean, it, it like to write a novel from scratch and then to have a literary agent for that novel all within about eight months. Amazing. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, that's really, it, it's, it speaks really of the writing of that draft. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And if we could elaborate for just, I have a question I'm mostly curious about. What do you think is, is lacking with writers that, that prevents us from going, crossing that threshold to, to be effective, to be persistent and successful? What is it that holds us back from that? And I know that you, you folks uncover a lot of that during the program, but I'm curious if we could get a bird's eye view of those particular afflictions, because I think that they're very yeah. pervasive, you know, across all of the arts. I think it's that we are trying to write a fourth draft as a first draft. And I think everyone, I think I do it. I think we all do it. Like we, we sit down and we're trying to make something that is ready for people to read. And that not only will not happen, <laughs> but it it tends to paralyze us a lot of us or at least make us go slower make us like fight all of these thoughts when really what we need to do down is like what we need to do is sit down and just play you know just play around just like get some stuff out there and it's not going to make sense and it's going to be messy and you're going to have a bunch of stuff that's like goes away and maybe embarrasses you if someone saw it, but like, that's the point. They, they're not going to see it yet. Mm -hmm. And it's not, they're not supposed to see it yet, but like, you got to go through that phase before you can get to the second draft, to the third draft, to the fourth. And sometimes I, I find the most helpful analogy, like building a house, because it's like, if you were going to build a house, the, the equivalent would be if we like looked at the place where we were going to build the house and we were like, okay, let's just come up in our imagination with where we're going to put like the paintings and how we're going to paint the walls and what the candles, where the candlesticks are going to go and where are we going to put the silverware? And it's like, you got to, that it, it, you're only going to get so far and before you've 
you've got to lay the foundation. you got to make a mess. <laughs> You're going to have a bunch of just like detritus. And then once you start to build this thing, you can get in and make it user friendly, but, and pretty, but like, you can't think about pretty until you have a foundation. And then until mm-hmm. you have walls and like you, you have to have something there before you can make it pretty. Mm-hmm. And we, I don't blame us because I think the way that a lot of like arts education is taught, like that class I took in college is like about, you know, particularly in writing, I think it can, so much of it is focused on like the quality, like the word choice and the quality of the sentences, which is to me is like step nine. (laughs) Like that's not like first, like what are you even doing? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Like why are, like, why are you even right? Like, it, it's very existential at first, and it should be. Like, why are you even doing this? Mm-hmm. What is this? And I think it's really important to ask those questions before you start being like, is this a good turn of phrase, you know? Or is this a good <laughs> metaphor? It's like, that's just, that's literally like step 25, not step one. Oh, I love that. Yeah. Yeah. So I got a couple more questions just to be mindful of your time here, but uh, this has been wonderful, Mary. Uh, I just had a wonderful time here. But lastly, I just want to uh, conclude here on the, the book incubator and, and really get a sense of, of what you're looking to achieve with this. And, and uh, if there's any other things that you'd like to share about the program that would serve writers who, who want to get that novel out into the world. Yeah, I would. So I would love for people to check it out. I have a bunch of information available um, to folks. It, they just go to the bookincubator.com. Here's the thing. It, they have to apply. Like we do, we do sort of curate the, who comes into the program, mainly just to make sure that it remains a really supportive community of serious writers. So I just asked two questions. I asked people what they're working on and what they would most hope to get out of a writing program. They don't have to submit a writing sample or anything. It's really just those two questions, but but we do ask that and, and they'll see that application at thebookincubator.com. And then for people who do join, I mean, my first hope is for them to like write the way that I think I want them to write the, the best possible version of their dream book. Like even if they do that, I think everything else is a bonus. I mean, we teach them how to get published and all the like the kind of commercial stuff because I think it's helpful to know that stuff. But, but I think more kind of, my, my goal is actually mainly more like soul based. <laughs> like I, yeah. I, I want them to feel like, wow, I did this. Like I wrote this book that I've had in me. In some cases, people have had it in them for like 20 years. Mm. Um, because it, because I know how that feels. It's just, it's so, it's like pride, but even better. It's like, <laughs> you know, you're like, so relieved (laughs) you're like i did it because it's just waiting to come out it's just a matter of time yeah but yeah um yeah lastly here i i'm very curious to know what's on the agenda for you in terms of your next creative work uh what are you looking to to do moving forward and where where do you feel you, you stand in terms of of how far you have to go or what you would like to achieve in the in the future yeah, my it's interesting just creatively like my goal, I think my goals have changed. I think when I started out I had like these big it was like I want to be on the New York Times bestseller list. You know, it was like which I don't think there's anything wrong with that, but I think it was like quantity of readers goal. Like I want, you know, tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of people to read my books. And now I think it's more like quality. Like I want to write for certain readers and uh, and that's enough, um, which is just interesting. Maybe that's just aging, <laughs> <laughs> but like, um, right now I'm, I'm revising a memoir about fertility struggles and pregnancy loss. Mm. And that has really also brought me here. Cause I find that I'm very much writing for a specific audience. Like I'm writing for, I'm picturing a woman who's going through some version of what I had gone through and wanting her to be like, yes, that's how I feel. Like I thought I was the only one. So I think that's also brought, helped bring me to this place of being like, I'm actually writing for, I don't know how small or big the audience is, but it's a specific audience. It's not the whole world, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And that's a, 
Normally, I would say that's a beautiful note to end on. It is beautiful, but I'm going to ask you one last one, one bonus question okay, here great. because I, I just <laughs> remembered it. Um, are there are there some uh, bits of, of entertainment books uh, or content that you're consuming that is that you're enjoying right now? What's something recently that uh, that has inspired you again to make some some stories? Okay, I have one. It's a novel by Gabrielle Zevin. It's called Tomorrow and Tomorrow and Tomorrow. And I am so in love with it. Like I have just been studying. I read it months ago and loved it. But lately I've been actually studying it Mm. because it affected me so profoundly. Now I'm at the stage of being like, how did she, let me dissect how she (laughs) did this. Um, But everyone I've recommended it to has like absolutely loved it. So it's about video gamers also, Mm. which um, sometimes when I tell people that they're like, what? I, I am not a gamer and I still, it was like my favorite book I've read in years. So you don't have to be a gamer to love it. Oh, that's wonderful. I guess, uh, I guess that about does it, but Mary, I want to thank you so much for the service that you're creating for your stories and for taking the time to share your own journey, uh, especially about being a parent, because it's, you know, something that's very important to me. And, uh, I know that folks are, are trying their best to do, uh, the best they can with what they have so yeah this has been a pleasure and i hope we get to chat down the road me too thanks for having me jamie this is great all right mary i hope you have a wonderful sunday and uh talk real soon thank you bye. love talking <laughs> bye you too bye